I'm a man of a certain age. I like good food, a nice steak, a bottle of wine. But I know it's important to look after myself too. So when I heard this the other morning, I almost choked on my muesli and low-fat milk. And a study says 1980s guidelines setting limits on eating fatty foods should not have been introduced. My name's Adrian Goldberg, and on the report this week, we try to sift the fat from the fiction. Have we been told to cut down on food that's actually good for us? So butter is good for you is the yeah. kind of headline this morning, but I think there's a little bit more to it than that. Are the existing dietary guidelines the best way to a healthy heart? What is the truth about fat? I'm at the supermarket doing my weekly family shop, and as I always do, I'm heading over to the dairy section and looking out for some of the low-fat foods. I've got the family pack here of the low-fat yogurts. Just bending down, just got the uh, organic skimmed milk. Here's the spread. It is uh, a reduced fat blend of butter and vegetable oil. Now, if I'm honest with you, I would sooner have butter rather than the spread. I would sooner have the full fat version of the cheese. But I've grown up believing that if you have full fat dairy products and other full fat foods, you've got more chance of having a heart attack. According to the UK's official public health guidelines, I shouldn't eat more than 30 grams of saturated fat a day. For women, it's just 20 grams a day. Compared to previous generations, that means less butter and cheese, less red meat. The advice dates back to 1983, but the debate about the role fat plays was simmering for years before. So the idea that saturated fat is bad for health goes back to a moment in time like any idea. It was in the 1950s in the US when the nation was really in a panic about the rising tide of heart disease. It come from pretty much out of nowhere in the early 1900s to become the number one leading cause of death. Nina Teicholtz is the author of The Big Fat Surprise. In her book, she examined the man whose research into the cause of heart attacks became the orthodoxy we still live by today, a pathologist called Ansel Keys. So the original hypothesis that Keyes had was that it was fat and dietary cholesterol. Those two things are found in animal foods, and those together would raise your total cholesterol and give you a heart attack. The cholesterol part of that hypothesis goes back to 1919 or 1918, when a Russian scientist fed huge amounts of cholesterol to rabbits and saw that this caused atherosclerotic plaques in the rabbit's arteries and therefore concluded that the same would happen in humans. But hold I mean, on a minute, aren't rabbits herbivores? They right. don't eat meat. Right. This is the you know, this is a fundamental point. Rabbits are herbivores. They don't eat dietary cholesterol. So that was an inappropriate animal model. And when that experiment was repeated on animals that are carnivores or omnivores, that effect was not seen. And it was his idea that saturated fats, eating the kinds of fats in butter, meat, cheese, dairy, eggs, would raise your cholesterol, clog your arteries, and give you a heart attack. So Ansel Keys' herbivorous rabbits set a scientific hair running, the idea that cholesterol found in food causes heart disease in humans. And Keyes developed his theory to include saturated fats in food. The hypothesis got rolling and was accepted as an idea, and then it became harder and harder to deal with evidence to the contrary, so much of it was just ignored. In Britain, Key's research was being questioned by John Yudkin, a professor of nutrition at Queen Elizabeth College in London. His son is Michael Yudkin. In 1957, my father investigated whether the increase in coronary heart disease could be correlated with the increase in the quantity of fat that was eaten in this country. And he found no reasonable relationship between the amount of fat that was being consumed, not the amount of total fat, not the amount of animal fat, no correlation at all. He did that on the basis of statistical analyses. Um, there were figures from the amount of fat that people ate. There were figures of the amount of coronary heart disease that had been diagnosed in the population. And he couldn't find any relationship between the those two figures. Yudkin argued that sugar was to blame for the soaring rate of heart disease, but his 1972 book, 
pure white and deadly, had a negative reception from many of his scientific colleagues. It did affect his funding. People who had undertaken uh, to support his research then stopped supporting it and uh, it made his life, his academic life, really quite difficult. Who were his principal opponents? In the United States, uh, somebody called Ansel Keys, who had developed the idea that uh, fat consumption had to do with coronary heart disease and wrote lots and lots of work on that. I think looking at it in retrospect, one would have to say that the work was quite badly flawed. Ansel Keys was selective in quoting his results. Uh, he took no notice of evidence that ran contrary to his ideas. But while Yudkin, who linked heart disease with sugar, was being ostracised, Keyes, who linked heart disease with fat, was lionised. In 1970, he published a breakthrough study, which has begun to be questioned in the last decade or so by critics like the author Nina Teicholz. It's called the Seven Country Study. It's like the Big Bang of nutrition science. He went out and he studied 13,000 men, in mainly in Europe, but also in the US and Japan, and looked at various different aspects about them, health markers, and then he correlated that also to their diets. And there were enormous methodological problems with his study. I mean, he chose countries where, he, due to pilot studies, he knew that there was low saturated fat intake, places like Greece and Italy, Yugoslavia, mainly because they were suffering from post-war deprivation and didn't have their normal food supply. He knew that they had low rates of heart disease. And he ignored those countries that also had low rates of heart disease, but ate a lot of saturated fats, like the, you know, the famous omelette eaters, the French. So the allegation is that Keyes picked the results that best suited his theory. But his findings found a receptive audience in Washington. Heart disease was soaring. Even a president, Eisenhower, had suffered a heart attack. Something had to be done. That something was a set of guidelines called Dietary Goals for the United States, published in 1977. If we as a government want to reduce health costs and maximize the quality of life for all Americans, we have an obligation to provide practical guidelines to the individual consumer as well as set national dietary goals for the country as a whole. Such an effort is long overdue. And then the report itself was written up by one congressional staffer with no background in science. That man was Nick Motton. I'm not a scientist, and my job was really to speak with a number of people who had done a lot of personal research and analysis around diet and public policy and how that might be improved in the interest of public health. What were your recommendations in regard to fat? The very general recommendations uh, had to do with reducing overall fat consumption from about 40% of the diet to about 30%, which wasn't really a hugely dramatic recommendation. There is also an interest in reducing uh, saturated fats. Those come largely from meat, some dairy products. You've acknowledged that you aren't a scientist, but you wrote the guidelines. So what was the scientific underpinning of those guidelines in relation to encouraging a reduced fat diet? Well, we consulted with about a half a dozen scientists who had done some of their own research and reviewed literature. A lot rested, I think, on what's called epidemiological studies, what people in whole populations are observed to do in, in relation to their health. It was thought of as a diet that would reduce fats, increase the use of complex carbohydrates, reduce sugar consumption, and also encourage people to do more exercise. Six years after the US guidelines, almost identical guidelines were published in the UK. Fat became the enemy, and that view has persisted for a generation. As Nina Teicholz, author of The Big Fat Surprise, discovered, you challenge it at your peril. When I first started out my research in the early 2000s, sometimes I'd get off the phone like shaking like I had been interviewing the mob or something because people were so afraid to talk to me. They were so hesitant. They were so careful about choosing their words. They were so afraid to say anything that contradicted the idea that fat and saturated fat are bad for health. That's because the idea had become orthodoxy. The message endorsed in adverts like this one for half-fat cream from the 1980s. Try. 
Put it on your cakes, pour it on your pie Ooh. Equals not like double cream because the fat is not so high So eat it, eat it Ooh. Equal hasn't got the dairy fat, you find it cream You can whip it So if I said to you, eating to avoid a heart attack, what would you think that you should be eating? Uh, healthy foods such as fruits and uh, items where there isn't any fat or less fat. Fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, whole grains, good meat, sort of lean protein. Why do you think lean meat? Because I would have thought processed meats and things like that, full of fats, not very natural, not as good for you as the better quality meat. I guess I associate heart attacks with a high fat diet. So what foods would you think you should avoid if you want to stave off a heart attack? I don't really know actually. I, I'm so confused now with all these news stories in the media and so on. So I would probably still avoid butter and red meat and things like that and sugar. And why would you avoid butter and red meat? Probably I'm suffering under the stigma that it's full of fat or something, I don't know. What have you got in your food bag? Prosciutto and Emmental. Very nice. Full of fat. <laughs> heart attack material. But is it heart attack material? After years of messages encouraging us to reduce our fat intake, a study was published last month which appeared to endorse saturated fats. The media were quick to herald a new dawn of diet. We can gorge to our heart's content? Apparently. Dietary advice from the 70s found to be a big, fat mistake. By scaring us of butter, health chiefs have made us fatter. Butter isn't bad for you after all. Zoe Harkham, a PhD student at the University of West Scotland, led the research which prompted the headlines. She is, if you like, the upstart, challenging the establishment view. She also writes diet books, leading some critics to claim that she has a vested interest in coming up with findings which support her beliefs, a claim she denies. Just tell me what you may have had for breakfast and what you might be having to have for lunch today. Oh wow, I've got steak for dinner tonight and I tend to have uh, eggs for breakfast. Husband has bacon and eggs. Harkham looked at the evidence used to justify the original dietary guidelines. She searched several science databases for randomised control trials, or RCTs, which are generally regarded as best practice for experiments such as testing new drugs. RCTs are carried out over a fixed period of time, with one group of people following, for example, a special diet, eating only foods low in fat, say, while the other group carries on as normal. Then you measure the change in both groups for something like cholesterol levels, her findings were published in Open Heart Journal. We found a number of very interesting things. Um, first of all, that there were only six randomised controlled trials. Only 2,467 men had been involved in those trials, so no women had been studied. And those men had already suffered a heart attack in all but one study. Looking at the totality of the evidence, there is no justification for the introduction of those guidelines in 1977 and 1983. Of course, as responsible researchers, we've then looked at the evidence since, it again says that there is no significant difference whatsoever in coronary heart disease deaths. So the evidence base was small. It mostly looked at men, and in five out of six cases, those men had already had heart attacks. And even then, says Harkham, there was no obvious link between a diet high in saturated fats and heart disease. So does that mean I can eat as much fatty food as I want? I'm off to find out over lunch with Dr Asim Malhotra, a London-based cardiologist and a leading member of the health campaign group Action on Sugar. If I order the cheese, are you going to share that with me? Well, I'm happy to share, share a cheese with you, yeah, definitely. Just looking at your burgers then, could I have your classic hamburger, please, with Stilton? Yes. And then to follow, I'd like your cheese board, please. I notice it's got four different kinds of cheeses to add to my burger with Stilton. And maybe a glass of whole fat milk? We just uh, have uh, semi-skim milk. So, Asim, I've ordered a meal that I think comes the closest that this restaurant offers to a, a heart attack on a plate, if judged by the existing public health guidelines. Do you think that that meal is likely to give me heart problems or contribute to heart problems? 
a very good question. I think from that particular meal, the one thing that concerns me most in that actually is the refined carbohydrate in the burger bun. The evidence really around saturated fat and heart disease has recently been questioned. And what it does suggest is that we know that saturated fats from non-processed dairy, so the, actually the cheese that you're consuming, may actually be protective against your heart. Um, and that's been confirmed from two major studies. One, which was carried out by the British Heart Foundation and the Cambridge Medical Research Council last year, and they looked at around 600,000 people. And what they found is actually a particular type of saturated fat, and at this point I must stress that all saturated fats are not the same. There are many different types, and that's something that's been ignored, I think, by many scientists, doctors, and the media that a dairy fat, margaric acid, um, actually was associated with decreasing the risk of, of heart disease. So cardiologist Dr Malhotra and PhD student Zoe Harkham, who wrote that controversial headline-grabbing research paper, tell me there's still no conclusive proof of a link between saturated fats and heart disease. Really? Uh, no, at least according to Simon Capewell, Professor of Clinical Epidemiology at Liverpool University. The Harkham paper is flawed in many ways. It, firstly, it asked the wrong question. It, it assumed that the only evidence has to come from randomised controlled trials. That's absolutely wrong. If you're going to develop policy, you develop it on the basis of the totality of evidence. So according to Professor Capewell, Zoe Harkham's approach was flawed because it focused on a small number of randomised controlled trials. But what about her suggestion that there's been no further evidence in the last three decades to support the link between saturated fats and heart disease? That's outrageous. There have been a thousand papers since then. Zoe Harkham and others say that Ansel Key's research, which was one of the underpinnings of the guidelines, has been discredited that Ansel Keys was selective in his studies. That's unfair and untrue. Furthermore, it assumes that Ansel Keys was the only person in business. He was part, firstly, he was part of a team for the Seven Countries study. Secondly, the work that they did was developed, reproduced and refined by dozens of researchers in different countries, and they consistently found the same pattern. So just to be clear then, you believe that the evidential basis on which guidelines were introduced were soundly based on science? I think that the dietary guidelines were prophetic and solid, and that history has demonstrated how very sound they were. Since those guidelines were developed and promulgated, cholesterol levels in both the States and the UK have fallen by over 20%. Uh, my group and others have demonstrated that this fall in saturated fat leading to falls in blood cholesterol have resulted in falls in heart disease death rates of between 50 and 70%. Simon Capel's evidence rests, partly anyway, on observations of changing patterns in society over a period of years, what are known as epidemiological studies. The problem lies with separating cause from effect. For example, death rates from heart disease have fallen. But how much of that is down to a reduced fat diet compared to, say, the massive decline in smoking, a proven heart attack risk? And then there are the significant improvements in emergency medicine. But are the randomised controlled trials held up by Zoe Harkham any more reliable, given the difficulty of monitoring people 24 hours a day to make sure they're sticking to a particular diet? It's not hard to see why there's so much room for disagreement. Isolating any one aspect of our diet is fraught with difficulty. So is there anything we can agree on? What we find consistently from the data that's out there already on studies is that actually a high-fat Mediterranean diet is actually probably the most powerful coronary protective tool. Definitely, definitely, both to prevent the first attack and also subsequently. So after people have had a first attack, they're advised to eat more fish and fish oils, uh, polyunsats, are clearly protective.
Dr Asim Alhotra and Professor Simon Capewell, both referring to studies which found that people given a Mediterranean diet, high in polyunsaturated fats but low in carbs, were less at risk of heart disease than those who had a reduced fat, higher carb diet. But that's the kind of diet recommended by the UK guidelines. Zoe Harkham from the University of West Scotland says the guidelines have had serious unintended consequences. If we tell people to eat less fat, we are concomitantly telling them to eat more carbohydrate. And indeed, the dietary guidelines at the same time are saying have no more than 30% in the form of fat, specified that we should be having 55 to 60% of our diet in the form of carbohydrate. This had never been tested. We had never undertaken a randomised control trial or even observed populations with such a high carbohydrate intake. So we did not know at the time if this would be healthy let alone safe and we think it bears research to look at what has happened since the dietary guidelines have been introduced in terms of obesity in the UK increasing from 2.7 percent to nearer 25 percent and also the epidemic of type 2 diabetes. We're looking at this little cheese plate here then yeah. got some grapes on it got a little bit of pickle some water biscuits and some well, four fine cheeses here. I'm just tucking into the Stilton. I'm noticing that the you're, you're getting stuck into the cheeses, which presumably are high in saturated fats. Yeah. But you're avoiding the water biscuits. The biscuits are high in refined carbohydrates. But on that point, what else is interesting about fat is that if you eat more fat, actually it's more satiating the carbohydrates. So you're going to feel fuller for longer. You're going to have less of an insulin spike. The current concept of a healthy, balanced diet, unfortunately, again, in my view, is not based upon evidence-based nutrition. If you look at the NHS Choices Eat Well plate, you know, they have foods in there which are high in refined carbs. They have a can of cola. How has a can of cola made its way onto the NHS Choices Eat Well plate? You're suggesting that over and above what you regard as misguided advice in relation to saturated fats, that What's happened as a result of these guidelines is that we've been driven into eating foods which ironically are more likely to cause us a heart attack than the foodstuffs that are high in saturated fats. You're absolutely right. And in fact, this low fat message being good for you is wrong. And one of the difficulties with creating low fat products is that when you take out the fat, you also remove some of the flavour a problem manufacturers compensated for by adding sugar. This is an ad from the 1980s for Marvel Milk, a low-fat powdered milk substitute high in sugar. Are you making the most of your Marvel? Marvel makes cooking deliciously light and helps keep you looking just right. When used in a calorie-controlled diet, Marvel's made from pure fresh milk but has almost no fat and around half the calories per pint. While the prevailing message was fat is bad, the message was carefully blurred to all fats. Liverpool University professor Simon Capewell is a member of Action on Sugar. The industry was then in a grand position to ostentatiously reduce the fat content of various products, quietly substitute with sugar, and that's promoted obesity, diabetes, rotten teeth, and a burden of completely avoidable disease. So is it time to change the official guidelines? Maybe to shift the proportions on the eat well plate? That iconic image you see in schools and GP clinics identifying what we should be eating each day. It recommends less fat and more carbs. Alison Tedston is the national lead for diet and obesity for Public Health England. These guidelines are about lowering heart disease risk. They are not about lowering the risk of obesity or lowering the risk of type 2 diabetes. But there are people who say that the guidelines, by encouraging people to have a reduced fat diet, to eat more carbohydrates, to eat more starch, that people have ended up becoming obese and getting type 2 diabetes, ultimately perhaps leading to heart disease because the guidelines have pushed them away from 
fats. The evidence as it is now says that if you have a diet that's based on around 50% starchy carbohydrates, predominantly whole grain carbohydrates, then that is a good thing for your overall health. But there is a separate evidence base that says too much sugar may increase your risk of having too many calories, which in turn leads to obesity, which in turn leads to increased risk of type 2 diabetes. But when people read your guidelines, they will see recommendations to have more low-fat dairy products. In many cases, those low-fat products, which people eat because they think it's more healthy for them, are packed with sugar. This is the idea that reducing the fat content will always increase the sugar content. It's not always true. It's not always true, but it is often true, isn't it? And the amount of added sugar in some of those low-fat dairy products we is would, extremely high. We would encourage people to read the labels. But do you accept that the guidelines which push people towards low-fat products are one of the reasons why people end up with type 2 diabetes and obesity? Um, no, we don't accept that. I, um, I'd like to see the evidence to support that. We, however, are quite careful to couch our dietary guidelines in terms of whole diet. So yes, um, we would not want to be encouraging excess calorie consumption, don't want to encourage excess sugar consumption, don't want to encourage excess saturated fat consumption. But the Eat Well plate, which is a NHS recommended daily diet, which is based on your guidelines, has on it a can of cola. It has... No, it doesn't. Uh, Show me a picture. Trust, I trust can't me. remember. <laughs> can I just say, can I just finish this question? Mm. The Eat Well plate does have a can of cola on it. It has white bread on it and there's also a recommendation to well, drink fruit juice, which, are also, which is also extremely high in sugar. This is NHS guidance based on your guidelines. Okay, so the Eat Well plate is currently being reviewed because of the changing advice that may be coming from our Scientific Advisory Committee on sugars and on carbohydrates later this year. After more than three decades of unchanging consensus, the accepted view of the link between fat and heart disease is being challenged as never before. And perhaps by focusing so much on fat, we've unknowingly opened the door to other serious health problems. The debate still rages over the link between saturated fats and heart disease, so I won't be rushing to eat a fry-up just yet. But what we can say is that the latest research shows that a diet high in polyunsaturated fats and low in carbohydrates does appear to be better for our hearts than the high-carb, low-fat diet we've been advised to follow since the 80s. And new evidence suggests that a specific type of saturated fat found in dairy might also protect our hearts. So is fat back? Well, the answer is, it's complicated. But it does seem that some fat can be your friend as well as a foe.